Okay, well, we'll um, get started and then I'll let people in as they, uh, as they arrive. Uh, do, do, do. So, no one's in here. Um, the, uh, something like this um, is, is a skill that you can use, you know, even as a, as a student, uh, which, which also translates to business. And it's the idea of being someone who helps organize and oversee things. Uh, you know, businesses will always be having projects that are happening, uh, you know, whether it's developing a new product, whether it's opening a new office, uh, whether it's expanding something, whether it's opening something internationally. And these projects have lots of elements to them. The projects, you know, they tend to be really, really complicated. So having the projects be cost effective and on schedule is a good skill. So that would be project management. The reason that I've decided to have a lesson about this is I was talking to some of my friends who are actually working and they were mentioning that it was um, something they think was very important and was a little underserved by the curriculum. So the idea of what exactly is product management? Well, the um, idea of overseeing a project uh, meeting your goals, uh, getting everyone on the same page, and especially that it is on time and it is on 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 budget. So, uh, I don't know if anyone has been to the um, Vaughn Subway extension. That was about four billion dollars over, and it was about a year and a half to two years late. So. The idea is when there's a big project like that, even though it might involve tunneling or building stations or scheduling workers or scheduling designers or buying extra trains, that all the elements to it will happen at uh, you know the appointed time. And when we were talking, we talked a bit about stakeholders with the um, ethical situations. Again, making sure that everyone's working productively, whether it's a contractor who's just working on the project, a full-time employee a manager, uh, you know, a partner, another company, a supplier, everyone who's connected to the project. It's about having them work together. And it really involves a lot of different tasks to it. So it's, sometimes people are very, very specialized, you know, like a, an actuary who calculates the risk of, of different things happening. So I want to make sure I'm not leaving anyone uh, from, preventing anyone from joining the class who, So just taking a moment to let some students in. Uh, do, do, do. So hopefully that helps those students get in. Um, and let me know if my screen isn't sharing correctly or there's a question. So someone who's an actuary, who, who's very good at making calculations about what, what are the odds of something happening in the insurance field, would be highly specialized. A project manager would be a little bit of all of these things, you know, be able to solve problems, be able to communicate to people, be able to have good attention to detail. And uh, project management is going to involve all of this. So why do we want to take it seriously? Um, because It'll improve the quality. Uh, it will result in a better pro product. Um, you know, if you're oh, trying to if you're trying to open up a new restaurant, you know, for uh, a company, it'll make sure that the the, the details of the restaurant that the uh, are, are are taken care of, that the staff are well trained, that the advertising is done well. Uh, it al allows you to have it on time, you know, and saves money. When people see how smoothly things are going, they feel a bit better, they feel more productive, and it will raise the company's reputation. So, as I mentioned, as an example of a big project, that Vaughn subway extension, it uh, was over budget, there was a two-year delay, there was an accident, 
where someone died due to some uh, safety issue. So all of those issues, you know, with a little bit of product project management may have been, may have been improve, improved and fixed. And then I see that uh, there's people in the waiting room. I'm trying to let them in. Okay, hopefully that works out. So uh, as you know, I, I've, I just finished reading a bit more detail about the Starbucks, their turnaround in 2007 to 2009. So their share price had gone down, their profit had gone down, the CEO was fired, uh, the previous founder, Howard Schultz, came back to take it over, and he, he managed to turn it around successfully. The, the, the share price went from $8 back up to $32. Uh, the, the, gro the, the growth rate started to happen again. So he didn't just decide that, oh, we'll change things around and snap fingers and get it to work. He actually had to undertake a series of um, a series of projects to make it happen, and some of the projects that were part of his turnaround plan were launching uh, a new type of espresso roaster, the ones you see at Starbucks where they grind it each time they make a shot, acquiring a company that makes those clover coffee brewers, launching a rewards card for the first time launching a website where people could uh, submit their suggestions and other users could comment on it. They didn't, re um, and they didn't really have um, a way for customers to interact with them. So they did launch this website and it still exists if you Google my Starbucks idea. Uh, launching Pike Place Roast, a new blend that they were gonna serve every day and improving their ethical sourcing. So all, um, Six of those projects required him to work with different people. It required him to, you know, ha ha um, sort of ha be on top of it, meet different deadlines, meet different budgets. It didn't all happen at once, but those were some of the small projects that were part of a big turnaround strategy. Okay. And uh, so what are the steps to it? And then you might notice that this might be similar to a school project. We have the start where we conceive the project and determine if it's feasible. So feasibility isn't necessarily, is it doable? Is it, can it be done at a reasonable price? Is it something that can reasonably be done in the timeline? Uh, you know, sometimes you're saying, oh, like the downtown relief line uh, the timetable that the government's put forth may not be totally feasible because of all the logistics that go into it. So it's determining whether it can be done in a reasonable time with a reasonable budget. And that there's a big business case for it. Sometimes managers get caught up with doing something that's big and fancy. They're a little too ambitious and they don't, um, you know, they don't make, they don't, there's, not a, there's not a market for it. They do something that sounds like it would be fun and interesting, but it actually isn't gonna create sales for them. So you, um, after you sort of get the idea and you get the idea of whether or not it can be done, you either are gonna write a project charter or write a project initiation document where you outline the purposes of the project, what the business needs, why does it need to be done, who's involved, who's, the, who's gonna be required to be involved, and what's the financial reasoning for proceeding with it. Here's a bit of an example of what a, a project initiation document will look like. You know, it starts off, what's the, what's the goal for the project? Why is this gonna benefit us? Uh, who's involved? What's the timeline? What's the budget? Um, what could go wrong? You, you know, oh, what could go wrong with this project? Well, uh, some of the resources are not available. Um, get extra people to help you deputize them so that they can help you make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, that there's, um, you know, people don't understand the requirements. Well, get everyone to communicate regularly so they understand what's going on. And then you, you sort of explain why it's a good idea. And there's lots of different templates out there. This is a little more visual. I have this new Apple mouse and I sometimes use my, click on it and that's why my screen jumps ahead. Um, 
So the next step is planning, you know, where you define what exactly the project's going to involve. So for the downtown relief line, you'd have to define how many stations would it be? Where is it going to go? Uh, what, 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 how much money is there for it? You try to anticipate the risks, like, okay, well, what if there was an accident? What if there was bad weather? What if things had to shut down because of an extreme situation like COVID-19? You might not be expecting a pandemic, but you, you still might want to plan in case um, things had to shut down for whatever reason. You, you want to have um, ways for people to communicate. That doesn't necessarily mean, oh, we only have meetings. You could be using an app for people to touch base and you want people to always be logged into the app and using it. Uh, it could be if someone sends you a message, respond to it within 24 hours. You want to have goals, um, the specific goals that are trying to be accomplished. So, you know, maybe, I don't know if you do this when you're doing your projects. Do you sit down as a group and talk about, okay, well, we want a 95 on this, or we want, you know, to have a very engaging presentation, or we would like to have um, a very interesting visual aid you know, whatever you, you, setting the goals and that's, that's how you judge whether you're on tr track or not. And then finally, with a company, it might be necessary to get a CEO or shareholders to approve it. So and one, sometimes what people do when they're doing the planning is they make what's called a Gantt chart, G-A-N-T-T. -T. And it has the key tasks on the y-axis, it has the time on the x-axis, it has, it puts the deadlines on it, it links tasks that are dependent. You know, for example, with the subway, tunneling has to go first before the track bed can be laid. The stations have to be dug before the stations can be finished. After all the infrastructure is set up, then you can do, you know, all the, um, you know, connect connection and, and making sure it runs well. Uh, it has a little bit of a way to determine how far you've gone and how what the individual workload is to make sure that no one does too much. So something like that might help with your school projects because it makes sure that no one person is, is, is too busy. So here's what it might look like uh, about a website. And it, decide, it takes the, the main tasks and divides them into subtasks. Uh, it's sort of, you can see these um, little length of the tasks. Some of them can overlap. It's okay to have, you know, the website design happening at the same time that you're getting quotes about the price. But other things, you might have to wait till something's finished. It uh, sort of tells you where you are currently and gives you an idea of what the progress is. And then at the bottom, it, it gives the, uh, a bit of an overview of who's doing what, who's doing the most tasks. So if we were looking at this, we'd see that Ishmael and Caleb, they have the most to do on this project. So something that could theoretically happen with this project is Ishmael, like you can see, he, he, he has 10, 12, 11 tasks all going at once. Uh, maybe that uh, that person might be too busy and might need to switch their work um, onto someone else. And you know, sometimes you um, you might be doing your you say your business project, and um, you know when your English work is due, you know when your physics work is due, you know when your history work is due. You know, you don't want to be that person in the red. Um, you know, doing four different subjects at once. You know, do planning things out like this, it might give you an idea of one week might be really busy and, and it might be a good idea for you to work ahead or for you to pass on doing something that week to do something later on. So that's sort of a visual organizer to sort of um, uh, help you understand whether or not you uh, are gonna to be too busy. And it helps things fit together because if you notice like, hey, um, the, this one here, the onboarding flow, it's at 0%, but we need it to finish so we can uh, move on to the next task. It, it lets you know what you need to focus on. So after the planning, 
um, comes the launch phase, you know, you assign resources, that's people as well. So you assign team members, the teams come together, they learn to work together, you get the supplies you need. So in business, that might be you send out a, a, a request for quote, quote, quotations so that people send you the prices like, oh, we'll give you this many tablets at this price, or we'll, you know, give you this much, uh, you know, website design for this cost, you pick who's gonna be the source, you have meetings and you track systems and then you ex execute the project plans and it's necessary to update them if you need them. So one thing that's a bit of a something new that a lot of companies are doing is it's a RACI chart, R-A-C-I, and it divides people into the following categories. Are they responsible? That is, you know, are they, have they been assigned to work on the project? Are they accountable? So one person is accountable for that little task. So if it doesn't get done or the goals aren't met, that one person is the one that's blamed or, or that, you know, the one that's spoken to. Oops, do, do. Uh, just want to make sure no one's trying to get in. Okay. Um, are they consulted? That is, you need to, ask their advice before you make a big decision or are they just someone who's informed so in some cases you know a task doesn't involve the manager but you just have to inform them when it's been finished and it can be done on a spreadsheet it can be done on a google sheet it can be done in excel or there's certain apps for it so again this might be something that you find is 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 helpful uh, you know, you take the tasks, you know, for each project and you divide it into subtasks. There's only one person who's accountable for each task. The one thing I would have changed from this example is I would have used red for accountable because to me that color jumps out more and I, I'd want to look at the chart and see who's accountable first all. And so you can see that at the start, Person number one is sort of doing this on their own, but they uh, have to consult and inform other people. And then as it gets going, uh, person number two and three, they start taking the lead. And so the idea is that you, you write down who's accountable and, and who's responsible. And it's a way of, you know, when it's not checked off in time, you have a serious discussion or you, hey, do you need help? What can we do to help you succeed? So that's a way, uh, a way to organize projects. Um, so it's launched. It doesn't necessarily mean that you finish it no matter what. Sometimes um, there might need to be a change or a cancellation. So key performance indicators would be the name of our goals in business. You might hear the term objectives and key results or OKR, metrics, deliverables. What, how are we going to judge if this is successful or not? So that that Vaughn subway extension would be judged on digging the amount of tunnel, building the stations on time, uh, completing the, sub, the extra subways that were needed, completing the circuits of the, you know, the train signaling system. You want to you don't want to have too many goals so they recommend you know three to five and review them regularly and sometimes companies use a color code like red is in jeopardy uh, close to failure yellow is uh, needs to be monitored green is on schedule uh, you could do a score out of 10 like oh it's eight out of ten it's done so um, we can move on to the next one we'll assign one person to finish off the last you know, a little bit, but we know it's mostly done and we're going to focus on what the one that's at three out of 10 and you, you want to keep track of the cost and update the timelines if needed. So um, here's an example of a goal setting chart and uh, there's different ways of doing it. Again, sometimes they color code it. Sometimes, you know, um, it's a tea company. So they want to um, improve their status as a, as a tea provider. So how will they know if they're improving their status? Well, if they have 
reorders at 85%. So it looks like according to this in the top right, they're five out of 10. At the self-serve, they have a target of 20%. Again, they're five out of 10. And they're hoping to get from their business this year, revenue of 250,000. So it's sort of, it's a way of, of, of telling you, okay, where are we right now? What's this week's priorities? How are we doing on those uh, priorities? What's next? And then just, you know, some overall charts. Sometimes people use like red, yellow, green, like a stoplight to determine which goals are most in jeopardy. So I mentioned Starbucks. So one of the things they were trying to do was to find a new drink to replace the Frappuccino. And they thought of a drink called the Sorbetto, which was a high sugar drink. It was very sweet. It had a bit of a yogurt taste to it, I guess. And uh, they decided, okay, we have to replace, the, not replace, supplement the Frappuccino. We haven't created a new drink for a while. Um, this Sorbetto can be it. And, but they decided that the first step would be to, you know, test market it in 300 California locations. So they, here you can see, a, they decorated all of them. They gave them, you know, special paint themed decorations and they launched it in 2008. But it turned out that they couldn't produce the ingredients locally like they had planned. The supplier that they wanted for North America fell through. So they were flying things in from Italy. And that was adding a lot to the landed cost. And it was hard to price it properly. They couldn't, because they were paying for extra transportation, the profit margin went up in thin air. And so they were looking at it and be like, hey, we had a goal of this much revenue. Where did all our revenue go? We're not making any money off of this. So they looked at that for one thing. Then they also, it turned out around that time, people wanted to start eating healthier and there was a high amount of sugar in this. So it just wasn't selling the way they thought. If you don't make as much profit, you need to sell more. So they decided that they would cancel it. So eventually things were reviewed to the point where they decided that, you know what, we're gonna cancel it and move on to another idea and you, you, they don't serve this anymore. So it's okay to cancel it. It would have been foolish to ignore all that evidence of declining sales and declining profits and launch it worldwide. They realized that the test launch was not successful. So last step with a project, it ends. So you wrap up the loose ends, you know, congratulate someone, give them a bonus for a job well done, give them um, an acknowledgement. Uh, terminate any contracts, you know, uh, you know, you don't need those extra workers coming to the Vaughn subway line after it's been um, finished. Um, you might want to give out a survey to everyone who was involved about what they learned, what they would suggest for the next time. You might ask anyone in the company to give their input. So even though the Sorbetto failed, Howard Schultz could still give the stakeholders a survey and be like, hey, what did we learn from this failure? What are the key takeaways so this doesn't happen again? Um, you, you might do a debrief. Uh, sometimes it's called a post-mortem. If it's in the military, it's called the after action review. That's a bit what went well, what could have gone better, what did we learn from this? So you want to get better and better as a company. And these reviews are a good way of doing that. Again, if it's bad, if there was a negative outcome, You'd want to understand why so that didn't happen again. In business, there are these, um, there's a term called a punch list, which is just the leftover tasks. Like, for example, with I mentioned the Vaughn subway extension. Maybe like the um, couple of elevators were not finished by the time it opened. So on the punch list would be like, finish the elevator at Finch West Station. Um, you know, fin um, you know, finish installing the LCD screens. Like there just might be like these leftover things that still need to be done. Um, so that could be called a punch list. And then usually the project manager is responsible to do a final budget and a report um, that sort of summarizes exactly what happened and what the company should learn for the next time. 
um, use a template for a, um, a meeting. You could use any kind of template you want. Sometimes using these templates is a good start. You talk about the issues, what went wrong, what's the solution, what's the action we're going to take because of this, and who's responsible for taking that action. Or you might say, hey, does anyone have any ideas? And for Sorbetto, they might say, um, let's make sure we can make it in North America before we launch it. Or, and then you know, somebody would be in charge of improving their, their, their production facilities in North America. So you know, this is a way to have a template. You know, maybe you, um, you're working, you know, you're in grade 10, you have a, a project and you like the person, they're your friend, uh, you want to work with them again, you don't personally have any problems with them, you know, it was enjoyable, it was fun enough, but you didn't get the mark you wanted, maybe there's something you can learn. Or, hey, we're going to do a bunch of remote learning this spring, and then it's going to finish at the end of June, and then we're probably going to start with more remote learning in September. So you don't want to forget what you learned the hard way over July and August. So if you have a review, you know, hey, this is what I learned about remote learning. Here's what I'm going to remember to do the next time. You know, it, it might be a useful exercise. I'm a big believer about reflecting after you've done something. So uh, here's an example of a project that needed to be um, updated. So with Starbucks, they need, realized they had a few too many stores that there were just too many stores in the same neighborhood. Some of the stores weren't profitable. Some of the stores, uh, the lease wasn't um, friendly enough for them to make the appropriate profit. Um, so they wanted to close some stores. And the person in charge of closing the stores, working with the CEO, Howard Schultz, says, okay, we're gonna close 200 stores. And the board of directors said, no, you're not. You're gonna close more than that go back and add to that list. It's that we're, uh, we need to save a little more money. We think you're being too conservative. Let's go back and find some new metrics to evaluate which stores to close. So they came back and then they had a list of 600 stores in the US to close. And they had to inform the media, the stores would be closing, the partners who were worried. They had to deal with contracts, you know, wrapping up any leases, they had to provide severance, there were a lot of customer concerns, so they had to respond to that, and all of that was part of the project. And it took, you know, about a year um, to finally get everything sorted out. And again, so they started off with the goal was, let's close 200, and then midway through, they had to change their goals to let's close 600 stores. So some apps that you might use in the workplace. So being good with Excel or Sheets or Smartsheet um, is can be, you can do these templates by hand in a spreadsheet. Basecamp is one and Slack is a very, very good one for working together. Here's a screenshot of Slack and you can see like one, you know, one person can assign tasks to other people. They can give that task a due date, you know, they can change the due date to move it up or back. They can add people to the project. They can add details to it. When the person who's responsible finishes, they click mark as com compl um, complete. You can ask questions. It monitors who's logging in. It gives everyone a to-do list for that day. So when we're working remotely and we can't talk to people face-to-face, -face, Slack is an app that's being used. So Again, with students, you're not going to be using Slack, but you can still um, have these routines of, hey, um, you're going to touch base every 24 hours, or whenever you make a change to the presentation slides, inform the rest of the group. You can still do some of these principles. So um, why do projects fail? Um, some things to avoid is uh, information silos, that is, the engineering team doesn't talk to the advertising team. And as a result, the product is slightly different from the one that's been advertised. Um, you know, the goals are not aligned. Maybe somebody wants to personally succeed and be congratulated for doing a good job. And then um, the other people, they want to do a good job for the team or 
you know, maybe somebody, it's like the director at Pixar wants a very um, artistically successful film, whereas Pixar, the company, wants one that will be popular and makes a lot of money. So sometimes not having people on the same page about the goals, um, you know, for, from your point of view, if you're working as a team, if one person's in charge of the slides and one person's in charge of the script, if you were siloed, like maybe there'd be times where the script wouldn't match the slide or there'd be a slide, but it wouldn't have a script to go with it. You know, so sometimes when people don't communicate, it's like that farm, you know, um, in the farm silos, they're very, very tall and narrow. Uh, silos mean that people don't, um, you know, communicate with each other or your goals might not be aligned. One person wants an 80, one person wants a 95, and then you find that you're unsatisfied with uh, how the project's going. A lack of a concrete objective. Uh, so what is it that you're trying to accomplish? Uh, the um, Starbucks for the Sorbetto, they wanted a new profitable drink. You know, sometimes uh, what might be an example of let's grow the company is not not a very concrete objective you could say let's increase sales let's uh, sell more healthy products let's sell more food items those are all things that are concrete but if you just say let's get bigger let's increase sales it might not be specific enough standards not communicated i think a big example of that would be the challenger explosion in uh, 1987 uh, there was um, a connection that wasn't properly sealed. And my understanding was one part was done, you know, in metric and one part was done in imperial uh, measurements and it didn't totally fit together. And as a result, uh, there was some cold weather. It damaged the, um, the shuttle and there was an explosion on takeoff. Bad deadlines, you know, deadlines that are too ambitious. You, you might the um, if you're saying hey we're going to finish our culminating in a week that might be a bad deadline because you're um, you're rushing it there's no way that's going to happen you're just setting yourself up to get all stressed out so whereas if you're a little more realistic you'd be like okay how, what's feasible okay I think two and a half weeks is feasible you're going to it's going to be a better deadline lack of oversight that's where um, the manager you know doesn't see what's what's happening and things like slack can be really good because you might not have time for a meeting something might be urgent and you might need to change it but you so you, you change it in the app and that way people can connect and there can be oversight throughout the week even though they're not face to face and so lack of oversight means you know that there was a problem but no one really addressed it until it was too late so those are some reasons that things can go badly. So here's um, an example of a uh, failure. So Google always has these big goals they call moonshots. But in 2016, they lost $900 million on these projects because none of them worked out. And maybe at some point, they, like the Google Glass was a big high profile failure. Maybe they could have said something you know, done something about this. Uh, the Google Glass was kind of a lack of a concrete objective. Um, the idea is they focused on, hey, this is cool, like this augmented reality glasses. Everyone will want um, a set of these. They're so new, they're so novel. Um, but they didn't really make a case about how it will help people. They didn't really make the case to the person, like how, how these types of glasses would actually help you. And it turned out it was a little bit premature. They didn't, you know, they didn't communicate to everyone why those um, glasses would be a good thing to buy. And as a result, sales were really bad and they pulled them. So you might see other, other failures. Um, the idea with project management is for Google Glass to be like, hey, wait a minute, what exactly is our plan? Like, are we being successful about this? Maybe we should delay it a little bit. If, if they had done a little more uh, attentive project management, they wouldn't have had such an embarrassment where they launched these set of glasses to a big fanfare and then nobody bought them. 
So that is kind of our thoughts on project management. Sorry that I took a little bit longer than